All of us who were still children 30 years ago can testify to the incredible changes that have occurred both within us and outside us. We have traversed, or better still, flown through a thousand year history. So stated the German Jewish historian Isaac Marcus Joost in 1833 in a public letter to a hostile Prussian bureaucrat. Joost took pride in the great strides that his Jewish contemporaries had taken in moving, as it were, from the Jewish Middle Ages into the German modern age. Their efforts to assimilate economically, culturally, and psychologically, he asserted, deserved approbation and support. In presenting Jewish assimilation as a rapid and quasi-miraculous journey of self-transformation, Yost articulated the view of the Jewish intellectual elite who embraced the possibilities of civic equality and social and cultural integration offered by the Enlightenment and 19th century political liberalism. Assimilation quickly became the central ongoing issue of debate within Jewish communities in the modern period, first promoted by progressive Jewish leaders and Christian supporters of Jewish emancipation alike. It was later decried by Zionist activists and Orthodox spokesmen as a betrayal of the Jewish people and of Jewish tradition. Assimilationist became an epithet of opprobrium. It has not been easy, even for scholars of the Jewish past, to explore the varieties and meanings of Jewish assimilation in the last two centuries in a non-polemical way, although recently a sympathetic understanding of the ideology and identity of assimilated Jews has emerged, particularly among Jewish historians in America, but also among some scholars in Israel. A number of historians have suggested that the blunt term assimilation obscures the varieties of behavior and the nuances of identity that characterize modern Jewry. The term assimilation often does not allow for multiple influences that together forge individual as well as collective identity. It doesn't allow for different social contexts in which one or another aspect of identity is expressed or for the coexistence of the desire for full civic integration with the retention of what we might today call ethnic particularism. With that caveat in mind, I will still use the term assimilation in these lectures because it, is, it has been widely accepted by both proponents and opponents of Jewish accommodation to the general society. Like Yost, historians have described the processes of assimilation of modern Jews as rapid and disruptive, as a traumatic break with the past. Yet the conclusions about the pace and extent of Jewish assimilation in the century of emancipation derive almost exclusively from scholarly investigation of the public behavior and pronouncements of urban Jewish men. The experiences of Jewish women and the contradiction between those experiences and the representation of women, that is the way women were portrayed, in organs of Jewish public opinion mandate a rethinking of the nature and significance of assimilation in the first generations of emancipation. That is why in these lectures I have chosen to focus on issues of gender. Gender is the socially constructed division of the sexes or in the words of historian Joan Wallach Scott, a constitutive element of social relationships based on perceived differences between the sexes. That is, gender is not simply a biological given. It's what we make as a society of the division between the sexes. I intend to demonstrate that considerations of gender can reshape our understanding both of assimilation in modern Jewish history and of the meanings that Jews have attached to assimilation. To assess assimilation and its impact upon modern Jewry in Europe and America, we must distinguish between assimilation as a sociological process and assimilation as a project. As a sociological process, 
Assimilation consists of several different stages. The first steps include the acquisition of the basic markers of the larger society and the more amorphous category of values. There follows the integration of minority group members into the majority institutions with the attendant weakening of minority institutions. The end point of assimilation, and it's not always reached, is the dissolution of the minority with its biological merger with the majority through intermarriage. For assimilation to proceed to its last stages, two mutually reinforcing factors must be present. The desire of the minority to become like and to join the majority, and the receptivity of the majority to the participation of minority group members in its midst. Without openness on the part of the larger society, it is possible for a minority to be fully acculturated and yet remain poorly integrated. The acculturation of 19th century Jews to the language, the dress, and the mores of the Gentile middle classes of their surroundings represented a break with a traditional Jewish mentality that had defined the Gentile as holy other. It also reflected an eagerness of the Jewish elites and then the Jewish masses to take advantage of the new opportunities made available by Enlightenment humanism and the extension of political rights. The process of assimilation also bespoke a new openness on the part of European and American elites to Jews as at least potential legal and social equals. As a process then, assimilation may be divided into two components, acculturation, which depends on the behavior of the minority, and integration, which demands changed attitudes and behavior on the part of minority and majority alike. As a project, assimilation was the official response of Jewish communal leaders in both Europe and America to emancipation, that is, to the conferral of civic rights upon Jews. It took more than a century for the Jews of the various Western and Central European countries, as well as the United States, to secure equal political rights. The vast majority of European Jews, those living in the Russian Empire, were not accorded equal citizenship until the 1917 Russian Revolution. Yet the issue of emancipation was on the public agenda from the last quarter of the 18th century. Because of the intense interest in the Jewish question, it was kind of the civil rights issue of the late 18th century, and particularly because of the debates surrounding the first emancipation of Jews in France during the French Revolution, Jewish leaders were well aware that citizenship was conferred with the explicit expectation that Jews would become like their fellow countrymen. Both those who favored and those who opposed Jewish emancipation at the turn of the 19th century looked askance at contemporary evidence of Jewish economic and cultural particularity, which they described as moral and cultural debasement. Proponents of Jewish emancipation differed with their adversaries in their conviction that emancipation would lead to a thoroughgoing improvement in Jewish behavior because the defects of the Jews, such as their superstitiousness and their dishonesty, resulted from persecution. As one writer of the French Enlightenment confidently put it in 1788, we can make of the Jews what we want them to become. With the cessation of legal discrimination and restrictions on Jewish economic activity, and the elimination of Jewish communal autonomy, that is Jewish self-government, the Jews would assimilate to their neighbors, differing from them only in the matter of their creed. The Jews of Western and Central Europe and the United States publicly accepted emancipation and welcomed the possibilities that it offered, including opportunities for acculturation and social integration. One French Jewish communal leader, for example, took the occasion of the Emancipation Decree of 1791 to call upon his fellow Jews to help realize an idyllic future of social harmony, in part by sending their children to public schools. Through this union in the schools, he wrote, 
Our children, as well as those of our fellow citizens, will note from their tender youth that neither opinion nor religious difference prevents fraternal love. For the most part, dissenting Jewish voices from this expectation of the easy attainment of fraternity would not be heard until the end of the 19th century. Throughout that century, the male Jewish elites who controlled Jewish communal institutions and who were generally recruited from among the prosperous and the acculturated exhorted their less upwardly mobile constituents to demonstrate either that the faith of the proponents of emancipation had not been misplaced in the case where civic rights had already been granted, or that the Jews were now worthy of equal rights in the numerous cases where emancipation had been partial or deferred. Yet the Jewish project of assimilation differed somewhat from the Enlightenment version. Although Jewish spokesmen forecast a harmonious future of equality, they had no intention of disappearing as a recognizable group into a homogeneous national society. In that respect, they dissented from the hopes of many Gentile proponents of Jewish emancipation. As the historian Uriel Tal, and subsequently others, have pointed out, Jewish leaders defined the goals of assimilation as the acculturation and social integration of the Jews, ideally into the bourgeoisie, into the middle class, along with the retention of some form of Jewish identity based upon a shared religious culture and upon shared memory. Denying the possibility of conflict between religious and civic obligations, they also presumed that successful completion of this project of assimilation would eliminate the last vestiges of social prejudice against Jews. In this, they were wrong. The historiography of modern Jewry has documented the relatively rapid acculturation of the Jews of 19th century Western and Central Europe and the United States, along with their impressive upward social mobility. I will begin my exploration of the interplay of gender and assimilation by addressing the experience of these Western Jews because they became the model for good and ill of assimilation. They also defined the problems associated with both the process and the project of assimilation. To be sure, village and small town Jews in Western and Central Europe initially resisted assimilation and maintained their traditional religious and economic patterns for several generations after emancipation. By the last quarter of the 19th century, however, the majority of Western and Central European and American Jews were city dwellers, assimilated in language and comportment into the local middle classes and successful players in the capitalist economy. In the German states, for example, at the beginning of the 19th century, Jews were poorer than their fellow countrymen, paying a disproportionately low share of taxes. By the end of the century, however, they were more prosperous than other Germans. Taking advantage of educational opportunities, impressive numbers of Jewish men became doctors and lawyers. And as is well known, in such major European centers as Paris, Berlin, and especially Vienna, Jews exerted a considerable influence as creators, critics, and consumers of high culture. And now I come to Jewish women. Jewish women assimilated along with their male kin, but they did so in different contexts, both in the West and in Eastern Europe and in the East European immigrant communities of America. Women's process of assimilation was shaped by their gender. In Western and Central Europe and in 19th century America, whose Jewish population derived primarily from Central Europe, Jewish women's gender set limits to their assimilation by confining them, like other middle class women, to the domestic scene, and thereby restricting their opportunities for education and participation in the public realm of economy and civic life. Unlike their brothers and husbands, middle-class Jewish women in Western societies confronted neither the workplace nor the university, at least until the 20th century. 
because their social life was rooted in their domestic context and in the religiously segmented philanthropic associations considered appropriate for women of their class, they had fewer contacts with non-Jews and experienced fewer external challenges to the culture of their childhood than did Jewish men. For most of the modern period, they therefore display fewer signs of radical assimilation, by which I mean uh, intermarriage and conversion. If one examines statistics on these most extreme manifestations of assimilation throughout the Western world, Jewish women have lagged behind their brothers, at least until contemporary times. In Germany, just to give you one example, between 1873 and 1882, women comprised only 7% of all Jewish converts. Moreover, men and women seem to have converted for, Jewish, for different purposes. Women primarily to join with a non-Jew in marriage, men primarily to overcome obstacles to their professional advancement. Although both men and women converted to obtain social mobility, the gender division of public and domestic spheres determined the nature and the timing of their decisions about radical assimilation. Only as lower middle class Jewish women entered the workforce in increasing number in the 20th century, and therefore had increasing contact both with non-Jews and with anti-Semitism, did their proportion among Jewish converts rise. But at 37% of Jewish converts in Germany in 1908, and 40% in 1912, the conversion rate of Jewish women still remained substantially below that of men. Among Western Jewish communities in the modern period, there is only one exception to the generalization that I've just given you about women's lower rates of intermarriage and conversion. In Berlin, in the years between 1770 and 17, uh, 1799, an exceptionally high 60% of the Jews who converted to another faith, there were only 249 of them, were women. And as the rate of conversion zoomed in the following decade, women again took the lead. Most prominent among these women was a small coterie of some two dozen women generally referred to as the Salon Jewesses. Celebrated as witty and charming, they took advantage of a short-lived, romantically inspired openness of intellectuals and poor nobility to the company of wealthy and cultivated Jewish women. They took advantage of this situation to make their mark in society and to enter into socially advantageous marriages with non-Jews, for which conversion was necessary at the time since civil marriage did not exist. Dorothea Mendelssohn, Henrietta Hertz, Rachel Varnhagen and their fellow Salon Jewesses temporarily found in Berlin high society a celebrity that was impossible in Jewish society, where entertainment was largely gender segregated and women's role as hostess and muse was neither developed nor admired. Despite the anomaly of their situation, the Salon Jewesses have most often been discussed not in terms of their specific social and cultural context, but as paradigmatic of Jewish women's experience as they confronted modernity. Historians such as Michael Meyer and Jacob Katz, and they've suggested that the Salon Jewesses typify the vulnerability of Jewish women to the blandishments of secular Western culture because of the failure of the Jewish community to provide them with any significant Jewish education. For Western Jewish women, however, this argument is not borne out by evidence, for the Salon Jewesses deviated significantly from the experience of other Jewish women, and it is the typical Western Jewish woman that I'd like to talk about now. Among the vast majority of Jews who neither converted nor intermarried, there does appear to have been a significant gender difference in Jewish practice and identity, but precisely in the opposite direction from the example of the Salon Jewesses. The historian Marion Kaplan's work on middle-class Jewish women in Imperial Germany, for example, 
demonstrates that the same men who absented themselves from the synagogue, who saw themselves and have been described in the historical literature as thoroughly assimilated, indeed as prototypical assimilated Jews, these men lived in families where their wives continued to take cognizance of the Jewish calendar and its rituals, even as the traditional observance of many practices waned among Central European Jews. The long-term debate between Sigmund Freud and his wife Martha over the lighting of Sabbath candles, which is well known, is therefore not idiosyncratic, but representative of a widespread gender difference in attitudes towards religious tradition. Most Jewish women seem to have been eager to maintain the symbolic rituals of Jewish life within the home, the domain which fell under their jurisdiction. And unlike Martha Bernays Freud, most seem to have prevailed. The rich collection of German Jewish memoirs and diaries from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, written largely by men, include numerous assessments of their families as non-religious and assimilated, while mentioning in passing that mothers taught their children Jewish prayers or even prayed regularly at home. Women seem to have persisted in rituals even after their husbands had abandoned these practices. One memoir of a German Jewish woman born in 1862, for example, recounted that her mother fasted and prayed on Yom Kippur while her father found it easier to fast after a hearty breakfast. In Victorian England, too, where the Anglo-Jewish elite encountered very little discrimination and felt comfortable with modest display of religiosity, Jewish women of the upper classes expressed a religious sensibility that was considered appropriate to their social class. Indeed, the historian Todd Endelman has found that the wives and daughters of communal magnates appear to have been more concerned with spiritual matters than were their male kin. For example, the wife and children of the liberal politician Viscount Herbert Samuel regularly attended Sabbath services while he limited his synagogue participation to the high holidays. Although Samuel had abandoned the traditional Judaism of his youth after losing his faith while at Balliol College, Beatrice Franklin Samuel did succeed in persuading her husband to refrain from working or traveling on the Sabbath. The inclusion of gender in the study of Jewish assimilation thus introduces for consideration the domestic realm, which often has tended to disappear from historical view. Given the privatization of much of Jewish behavior in the wake of emancipation, it's essential to enter the Jewish home to assess the nature of Jewish assimilation. To do so, historians have to work assiduously and creatively Mining resources like memoirs, diaries, personal correspondence, material culture and visual artifacts, and praying that these things have survived, in order to bridge the division of public and private spheres and to explore the tensions between public and private selves. To give you just one suggestive example, a recent museum exhibit on the Dreyfus Affair took place at the Jewish Museum in New York included in the section on the Dreyfus family a decorative cloth which was displayed on the wall in the Dreyfus home. What does it signify when a highly assimilated Jewish family, often depicted as alienated from the Jewish community and from Jewish tradition, chooses to display a cloth that visually celebrated the three pilgrimage holidays of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles? Surely it suggests a more complex identity as assimilated French Jews than we might have previously imagined. The persistence of Jewish ritual and of the display of religiosity among Jewish women in assimilated families like the Dreyfus interior decor are examples of how attention to gender and to domestic life challenges stereotypic views of assimilation. Such behavior was by no means limited to the European scene in the second half of the 19th century. 
there is now considerable evidence of a similar gender division in religious practice among second and third generation Jewish families of Central European origin in America. Certainly, by the end of the 19th century, commentators alluded to the feminization of the synagogue, a parallel phenomenon to the feminization of the Protestant churches described by a number of historians. Typical is the 1897 remark of one Jewish woman who wrote of reformed synagogues of the time, year in and year out for many long years, the rabbi's efforts in sermon and lecture have been prepared for and delivered to congregational audiences composed almost exclusively of women. This depiction of the retention by middle-class Jewish women of a greater measure of Jewish observance than their male kin is not intended, by me at least, to suggest that women were by nature more loyal than men to Jewish tradition. Rather, it points to the fact that middle-class gender norms of behavior eroded traditional patterns of Jewish practice among men while facilitating a measure of Jewish ritual among women. The comparatively high degree of religiosity of assimilated Jewish women is thus in itself a female form of the project of assimilation. By the middle of the 19th century, Western Jews had adapted themselves and their Judaism to the prevailing bourgeois model of female domesticity that called upon women to create a peaceful environment free from the stresses of the larger society and devoted to the preservation and transmission of traditional morality, while men assumed the burden of earning a living and governing society. Religion fell naturally within women's domain for it drew upon emotion to disseminate morality and fortify the social order. Modern men were considered too busy with worldly concerns to assume this task. Bourgeois culture thus expected women to be at least moderately religious, certainly more religious than men, since they were deemed inherently more spiritual. And the bourgeois division of labor between the sexes conferred responsibility upon women for religiously based good works, including the basic religious education of children. Although traditional Judaism had also recognized women's spirituality, it had reserved the elite manifestation of religious piety, both leadership in the synagogue and the intensive study of sacred texts, to men. When life in the modern Western world led most Jewish men as they assimilated to abandon traditional Jewish culture and limit their religious expression to periodic appearance at synagogue services and some communal work, their wives absorbed the dominant societal expectations of women as the guardians of religion. Bourgeois culture also linked religious expression to familial sentiment. Because so much of Jewish religious ritual is home-centered, it was relatively easy for women to meet bourgeois norms. There was less dissonance between Jewish religious practice and women's daily routines than was the case for men, whose traditional Jewish role was centered in public ritual in the synagogue or the house of study. By retaining some domestic aspects of Jewish tradition, including customary foods, and by transforming others into ostensibly secular family celebrations, such as the Friday evening in place of the Sunday afternoon dinner, Jewish women fulfilled their prescriptive role and transmitted what the anthropologist Barbara Meyerhoff, in a very different setting, Venice, California, uh, called domestic Judaism. The general norms of bourgeois society thus reinforced the retention by women of domestic Jewish ritual practice while undermining ritual observance for men. Men and women alike within Western Jewish communities thus adopted the dominant view that women were responsible for inculcating moral and religious consciousness in their children and in their homes more generally. According to this view, they were also the primary factor in the formation of their children's Jewish identity. 
the conservative role of maternal keeper of the domestic flame of Judaism became a central aspect of the project of assimilation. In the countries of the West, the Jewish press, which emerged in the middle of the last century, frequently expressed this concept of women's centrality in transmission of Jewish culture and identity. For example, in 1852, the Archive Israelite, the journal that represented progressive Jewish thought in France, depicted a bourgeois Jewish family where gender roles were highly differentiated and where the socialization of its children depended upon the mother. Our fathers, absorbed by their business, their commerce, their industry, their travels, cannot follow with a vigilant eye the physical, moral, and intellectual progress of the young family. They abandon that care to maternal solicitude. The woman is the guardian of the house. Her religiosity, her virtues, are a living example for the children whom she has constantly under her eyes. Man exists for public life, woman for domestic life. The German Jewish press also waxed eloquent about the role of women within her prop, woman within her proper sphere. One newspaper in 1895 went so far as to call the Hausfrau a priestess of the home. American Jewish leaders shared this assessment of women's nature. The very same year that the German housewife was dubbed a priestess, prominent reform rabbi Emil Hirsch described her American counterpart as a priestess of the Jewish ideal, prophetess of purity and refinement. In recognition of women's important role as the first and sometimes the only Jewish teachers of their children, Jewish communal leaders began to emphasize the importance of providing sufficient Jewish education to girls to enable them to carry out their destined maternal responsibilities. As the Archiv Israeli put it in 1852, the health of our religion depends henceforth above all on the education of girls. Jewish women in the West who had encountered the challenges of secular culture not only accommodated to prevailing expectations of the middle class woman's role in the home, they also reshaped the boundaries between the domestic and the public spheres and thereby assumed an expanded role within the Jewish community. The female version of the project of Jewish assimilation thus contained potentially radical elements in addition to its conservative domestic thrust, uh, which I've been stressing up till now. Middle-class Jewish women in Western societies, and particularly in the United States, happily claimed the new definitions of female responsibility for religious socialization of the young and for care for society's unfortunates. Drawing on these gender norms and later on the ideology of domestic feminism that claimed that society was merely the domestic realm writ large, women developed new forms of Jewish expression and began to articulate the need for communal recognition of their public roles. In the relatively small and new Jewish communities of 19th century America, middle and upper class women adapted the prevailing American concept that charity was woman's work, and they expanded the philanthropic activity that Jewish women had conducted in Chevrot associations in the traditional Jewish community. Virtually all Jewish communities in America, for example, sustained Hebrew ladies' benevolent societies. In Philadelphia, the renowned Rebecca Gratz, along with several other women who worshipped in the city's premier synagogue, Mikveh Israel, in 1819 established the Female Hebrew Benevolent Society, whose volunteers organized home relief and ultimately medical care for the local Jewish poor an employment bureau for women and children, and a traveler's aid society. Some 20 years later, in 1838, women who were already active in this female Hebrew benevolent society founded the first Hebrew Sunday school in the United States, which became a model for many others that followed. The women who dedicated themselves to philanthropic and educational work among their fellow Jews 
define their activity in moral and religious terms. Although they were influenced by Christian models of female philanthropy, they saw their efforts as a safeguard against Christian missionaries who knocked on the doors of poor Jews to offer assistance that was accompanied by proselytizing. Jewish female activists also enjoyed the possibilities for sociability that volunteerism offered them, as well as opportunities for demonstrating their skills beyond the confines of their individual homes. Similar concepts of female duties and possibilities for self-expression led Jewish women in Western and Central Europe to express their maternal roles in social institutions dedicated to caring for the Jewish poor and to providing Jewish education. In the small Jewish community of England, Louise Rothschild played Rebecca Gratz's role, founding the Jewish Ladies Benevolent Loan Society and the Ladies Visiting Society in London in 1840, and taking part in the administration of the Jews' free school. Rothschild and her fellow volunteers, like Jewish women in the United States, combined traditional Jewish patterns of charity, of tzedakah, with the new forms of denominational philanthropy that were conducted by Christian women. In 19th century Germany, on the other hand, Jewish women tended to conduct their charitable work along more traditional lines. They doled out poor relief, cared for the female dead through the female Hevra Kadisha, the burial society, gathered money to provide dowries for poor brides, and administered funds to ensure that indigent Jews had the means to celebrate holidays. Yet they too expanded their philanthropy, creating women's societies organized according to the latest concepts of scientific charity and concerned with the education of girls and the welfare of children. Although most Jewish women in the West express their Jewish sentiment primarily through private devotions in the home and through sectarian philanthropy, there emerged a handful of exceptional individuals who saw it as their responsibility to accomplish the task of Jewish education and the defense of Judaism through the written word. They based their activity upon the modern expectation that women would serve as the primary inculcators of Jewish consciousness to children. In traditional Jewish society in Eastern Europe in the 18th century, a few women had composed tachinas. These were petitionary prayers in Yiddish intended for a female audience. In Central Europe and the United States in the 19th century, modern descendants of Sarah Bas Tovim and Sarah Rebecca Rachel Leah Horowitz, who were two authors of collections of tachinas, also wrote prayers in the vernacular, in German or English rather than Yiddish, and with a modern sensibility. Thus, the poet Panina Moise of Charleston, South Carolina, composed the first American Jewish hymnal and served incidentally as the director of Congregation Beth Elohim's Sunday School. In 1855, Fanny Noida, the widow of one rabbi in Moravia and sister of another in Vienna, wrote a German prayer book for women entitled Stunden der Andacht, Hours of Devotion, that was so popular that it went through 28 editions by the 1920s. The most prolific and influential of these Jewish women writers who addressed religious themes was England's Grace Aguilar, who was of Portuguese Murano descent. In her short life, she lived to be only 31, in addition to novels, poems, and translations, she wrote a number of books about Judaism. Apologetic in tone, they were designed to instill pride in Jewish readers and to reinforce the faith of Jews fully at home in Western culture. Aguilar saw her role as defender of the faith against widely accepted Christian disparagement of Judaism. In her 1845 volume, The Women of Israel, which surveyed Jewish history with particular attention to the biblical era, she was anxious to prove that the position of women in Judaism was higher than in any other culture. And I'm quoting her. It is impossible to read the Mosaic Law, she asserted, without the true and touching conviction that the female Hebrew was even more an object of the tender and soothing care of the Eternal 
than the male. Aguila's defense of the high status of women within Jewish tradition, though intended to provide rationales for loyalty to Judaism, derived from the assumptions about gender and assimilation that were widespread among acculturated Jews of her generation. In Aguilar's view, Jewish women had a special religious vocation or mission as witnesses of that faith which first raised, cherished, and defended them. Because of their natural spirituality, Aguilar urged the Jewish woman, in contradiction to traditional Jewish custom, to dedicate the gift of her silvery voice and ear for harmony, not only to pleasing man, but also to singing God's praises in his sanctuary, as well as teaching songs of thanksgiving to her children at home. In fact, Aguilar highlighted the role of Jewish women as teachers of their children. But rather than seeing this role as a recent addition to women's tasks, she asserted that its source was our ancient fathers, whose opinion is evidently founded on our holy law. To the women of Israel, then, she concluded, is entrusted the noble privilege of hastening the great and glorious day of the Lord by the instruction they bestow upon their sons and the spiritual elevation to which they may attain in social intercourse and yet more in domestic life. Aguilar's The Women of Israel suggests the double-edged possibility of the bourgeois gender division that defined religion and the inculcation of religious sensibilities as falling within the female domain. That's why I've spent so much time on it. On the one hand, Aguilar manifested both a strong loyalty to Jewish faith and to Jewish distinctiveness, and a firm belief in women's inherent religiosity, as well as in her physical and mental inferiority to man, doctrines that we might label profoundly conservative. On the other hand, on the basis of her understanding of women's religious mission, she championed women's religious education and the ceremony of confirmation for both sexes, innovations that we could rightly see as progressive. In fact, she recognized the opportunities that her own time offered Jewish women, and she concluded her book with a call to the women of Israel to take advantage of their new opportunities. For in her words, they were now free not only to believe and obey, but to study and to speak of their glorious faith. Furthermore, anticipating some aspects of 20th century feminist analysis, she even recognized that the gendered division of labor in 19th century Western societies provided women with advantages not enjoyed by their husbands and brothers. It is fully in woman's power to, so to do, yet more so than men, those are her words, for the ordinances and commands of our holy faith interfere much less with woman's retired path of domestic pursuits and pleasures than with the more public and more ambitious career of man. By the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, acculturated middle and upper class Jewish women living in Western societies had taken to heart the message of women's potential for religious and social influence in both the domestic and the public sphere. The writers and editor of the American Jewess, for example, an American periodical, often referred to women as queens of the home, who were meant to bring about the reign of religion and reinstate the Sabbath to its old glory. Building upon the accomplishments of the earlier female charitable associations and upon female activism within the larger society, Jewish women established important nationwide organizations in the United States, in Germany, and on a smaller scale in England. Uh, the National Council of Jewish Women, founded in 1893 and attaining a membership of almost 50,000 by 1920. Uh, that was an American uh, organization that preceded Hadassah. Uh, in Germany, the Jüdische Frauenbund, which was established in 1904, and that within a decade attained a membership of 35,000 and 50,000 uh, by the end of the 1920s. And in England, the smaller Union of Jewish Women 
that emerged in 1902. All three of these organizations cooperated in the international campaign against white slavery and lobbied for greater recognition for women within their respective Jewish communities. Specific programs that related to the contrasts among their home countries and the Jewish communities, all three of these women's organizations asserted a distinct role for women as sustainers of Jewish communal life and as guardians against defection from Judaism. Although they never challenged the primacy of home and domestic responsibilities as the proper central focus of women's lives, they reconfigured the boundaries between the domestic and the public spheres. In teaching administrative skills and conferring public positions of authority and responsibility upon their members, they also expanded the range of appropriate female behavior. In addition to taking upon themselves extensive responsibility for philanthropy and social welfare as part of the middle class woman's religious and moral burden, American Jewish women in the 20th century carried their domestic talents into the synagogue and sacralized the home as the site of Jewish observances. It became their mission to make the synagogue more homey and to realize the potential of the home as a sacred sphere for the transmission of Judaism. With the decline of the synagogue sisterhood as a charitable organization, women turned their attention to the domestic management of the synagogue. National organizations of synagogue sisterhoods, divided denominationally, gave women a visible role within the synagogue. Although most synagogue sisterhood members may have devoted themselves to decorating the sanctuary for festivals and to serving tea at the Onik Shabbat and to promoting Judaism through attendance at synagogue services, some historians have shown that the Reform Sisterhood organization in particular provided a platform for the articulation of demands for greater public participation of women in the synagogue itself. Sisterhoods organized sisterhood Sabbaths, performed manifold housekeeping functions, and took a particular interest in the smooth functioning of the religious school. Reformed sisterhoods often assumed responsibility for conducting services during the slow summer months. In 1924, the president of the Reform National Federation of Temple Sisterhoods could declare Woman has at last found her niche in religious life as well as in civic and political work. We do not find her today relegated to the gallery of the synagogue, docilely watching the men of the congregation. Her voice is heard on the temple board. Her advice is asked in the direction of affairs of the Sabbath school. She is, in fact, a force in the religious community. On the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the organization in 1938, its founding president, Carrie Simon, even called for the ordination of women as rabbis. And it took another 34 years uh, before that call was realized. In the 1920s, sisterhood organizations also elaborated upon the now familiar representation of the woman's domestic role as priestess. The conservative movement's Women's League, more concerned with Judaizing the home under female auspices than feminizing the synagogue, sponsored a number of publications designed to facilitate the Jewish housewife's ritual task as she enhanced the Jewishness of her home. Most popular was Deborah Malamed's The Three Pillars, first published in 1927, and outlining the obligations of the Jewish woman in the areas of Sabbath and holiday observance, prayer, and child rearing. The three pillars crystallized the view of the woman as the religious and moral arbiter of the Jewish family par excellence and called for the education of women to prepare them for their maternal responsibilities. In describing the Sabbath, Malamed wrote, in many homes it is the Jewish woman who must assume almost the entire responsibility of fostering her children's religious life and of transmitting to them that spiritual heritage which has molded her own. To facilitate their members' fulfillment of their central role in preserving and transmitting Judaism, 
1931, the Women's League spurred the establishment of a Women's Institute of Jewish Studies by the Jewish Theological Seminary. Reform and Orthodox sisterhood groups, too, took steps to deepen the Jewish knowledge of their members in order to strengthen ritual observance in the home and prepare mothers to inculcate a positive Jewish identity to their children. The Western middle-class definition of womanhood once again provided Jewish women with a conservative role, but also promoted innovation and expanded educational opportunities for females and a more visible presence in the synagogue. The adoption of Western bourgeois concepts of female religiosity also had negative consequences for the depiction of Jewish women, at least in the Jewish press. Despite the gender differences in both the timing and the extent of Jewish assimilation, with women being uh, far less assimilated in many ways than men, the representation of women and assimilation in public Jewish statements of the 19th and early 20th centuries in both Europe and America diverges markedly from the demonstrable historical record. By exploring the contradiction between female experience and female representation, we may discover a fundamental ambivalence about the project of assimilation, even among the male communal leaders who generally supported it. In the second half of the 19th century, as assimilation was proceeding with all due speed in the cities of Europe and America, articles critical of Jewish women began to appear regularly in the Jewish press in Germany, France, England, and the United States. Rather than noting the gender differences in Jewish practice, which we have documented, and because of them chastising men for their defection from the Jewish community, these articles blamed women, particularly mothers, for the signs of radical assimilation that were capturing the attention of Jewish critics. Clearly, this criticism is not wholly surprising, for as we've seen, bourgeois ideology conferred on wives and mothers responsibility for the moral and religious tone of the home, and Jewish spokesmen had adopted this ideology. If the family was no longer succeeding in transmitting Jewish knowledge and loyalty to the younger generation, then the guardians of the hearth had fallen down in their task. In preparing their sons so well to enter into the institutions of the larger society, mothers were neglecting the inculcation of a Jewish identity. As the Archiv Israelite noted with regret in 1889, the Jewish woman was not the model of piety she had been only 50 years before. All the general qualities of the modern woman have developed in her at the expense of the particular qualities of the Jew. And therefore, it stated, she leaves her children, unfortunately, in absolute ignorance of their faith. This communal expression of disappointment in the failure of Jewish mothers was by no means limited to the French milieu, but was articulated in all the societies which had experienced emancipation and assimilation. In 1875, the London Jewish Chronicle commented, Possibly there is no feature of the age more dangerous or more distressing than the growing irreligion of women. Similarly, German Jewish spokesmen took women to task for failing in their sacred responsibility. Women are giants who carry the world on their shoulders by caring for the home, editorialized one paper. If the religious home fails, so does the world of religion. And in Texas, too, in the late 1870s, Jewish women were pointedly reminded of their new responsibilities. You, as daughters of Sarah and Rebecca, ought never to forget that it is your sacred duty to instruct your children, to give them a religious and moral training. Remember that there is a great debt of responsibility resting upon you, and that you are held accountable for the acts of your children. Fathers, interestingly enough, are entirely absent from communal discussions about the younger generation. In my survey of the 19th century Jewish press of these four countries, I found no references specifically to fathers' responsibilities 
for the education of their children or the inculcation of a Jewish identity, nor was there any blame of fathers for the defection of their children from the Jewish community. Yet within the pre-emancipation Jewish community, the obligation to educate children, primarily sons, rested precisely upon the father. In practice, the father's obligation was socialized, for the male heads of household within a community assumed responsibility for establishing educational institutions for all the children of the community. Indeed, universal literacy in Hebrew and familiarity with the biblical text was a communal ideal for all males, and in many communities, uh, women were provided basic instruction in reading as well. The transfer of the obligation to educate Jewish youth from fathers and communal institutions to mothers with greatly reduced communal institutional support was, as we've suggested, a major aspect of the assimilation of Western Jewry to the norms of the larger society. It permitted Jewish men to pursue success in the worlds of commerce, civic affairs, and Jewish communal life, while relegating the transmission of Jewish knowledge and identity to the domestic sphere and to women, who incidentally had fewer educational and material resources to accomplish the task. By focusing, in the case of Jewish communal critics, on the failure of Jewish women to fulfill their assigned role, or in the case of Freud and other Jewish men who had become highly secularized on women's eagerness to fulfill it all too well, Jewish men were able to ignore problematic elements within the project of assimilation itself, particularly as they related to their own behavior. And that's the point I wish to close with. For the project of assimilation, as I see it, contained a source of tension that was not acknowledged as the Jewish elite pressed for social along with civic equality. That source of tension was the presumption that limits could be set to assimilation, that Jews would not disappear completely into the larger society, that is that the last stage of assimilation would not uh, take place. That assumption was belied by the increase in Western Jewish communities with each succeeding generation of signs of radical assimilation. As I have demonstrated, because of the bourgeois gender ideal, men predominated among those who assimilated radically through conversion and intermarriage, while women, even as they assimilated, seemed to have retained more signs of Jewish identification than did the men in their families. Yet the male leadership of the Jewish community was reluctant to assume responsibility for radical assimilation. It could not renounce the social, economic, and psychological benefits of emancipation and of adoption of Western culture, nor could it devise an effective strategy for promoting Jewish communal persistence while allowing individual male ambition to flourish unchecked. Blaming Jewish mothers for the decline in Jewish knowledge and religious practice, therefore, proved a useful strategy that enabled Jewish men to continue the business and the project of assimilation. <laughs>